Belarus is a country known for being the last dictatorship in Europe. And as you might say, here we go again. The visual politic guys are labeling everything that does not fall into the interests of capitalism as a dictatorship. But not exactly. Even Belarus's own dictator recognizes what he is. Check this out. It's better to be a dictator than gay, declares Belarus president. Putting that internalized homophobia aside, you're probably all thinking, what kind of dictatorship can it be if they've just had elections? Yes, my visual politic amigos, on the 9th of August 2020, Belarusians went to the polls as they do every five years. And for the sixth time, Alexander Lukashenko won. And you're probably wondering what kind of margin he won by. Was it 51%, 60, 70? Well, no, it was a totally legitimate 80%. As you can probably imagine, this result is dodgier than a $9 banknote. And the truth is, it's neither the first nor even the second time. This man has manipulated so many elections that he doesn't even try to hide it. Listen up. We have rigged the latest election. 93.5% have voted for Lukashenko, but they say it is not a European outcome. So we have made it 86%. Alexander Lukashenko, after the elections of 2006. Okay. Believe it or not, your ears are not deceiving you. Lukashenko is more than a dictator. He is a classic villain in a James Bond movie. Megalomaniac, thirsty for power, and completely lacking in any scruples whatsoever. Remember this image because it will help us to better understand the current situation in Belarus. But anyway, Let's get back to our story. In August of 2020, Belarusians had elections. As is already traditional in these places, the opposition candidates have had to leave the country. Lukashenko's detractors, as you can imagine, have taken to the streets and many of them are in jail. How many people are we talking about here though? Maybe 100 inmates? 500? Well, no less than 6,700 detainees, according to the Belarusian authorities themselves. And many among those are minors. And I don't think anyone's going to be surprised if I tell you that Belarusian prisons are pretty much the last place that you would want to be. Inside the TSIP, dozens of men were told to strip naked and get down on all fours, whilst officers kicked and beat them with truncheons. Let's put aside that in some clubs that I go to, you have to pay pretty good money to get that kind of treatment. I know what you guys are all thinking. We've seen this before. Here we have a former Soviet Republic where human rights are at best optional. Suddenly, a political event brings hundreds of thousands of people out into the street. The government, in response to this, suppresses these protests with violence. And this story might sound familiar to some of you because it's the exact same thing that happened in 2014 in the Ukraine. Do you remember the Euromaidan protests? And you remember how that story ended? It ended with this guy. That's right, my three time in a row Halloween costume, Vladimir Putin, invaded Crimea to prevent Ukraine from leaving its area of influence. So the question we ask ourselves today is, can Belarus really be a democracy? Will Putin's army be sent in to defend Lukashenko? Is Belarus the new Ukraine? Today, we're going to answer all these questions. But first, as always, let's take a look at some history. We cure coronavirus with vodka. By now, we've all heard some pretty ridiculous theories about the coronavirus, from conspiracy theories to magic treatments. Well, check out Lukashenko's recipe for fighting COVID-19. Vodka and saunas will cure coronavirus, says Belarus president, as he refuses to lock down country. He also said, although many other leaders have said the same thing, that coronavirus would not affect Belarus. And he called the pandemic a global psychosis. Yeah. Really, you're not hearing things. From the outset, Lukashenko was very clear that this coronavirus thing was not going to affect him. He even urged Belarusians to stop wearing masks. And so, while half the world was confining itself at home, Belarus organized mass events such as the May 9th parade. And what happened next? Pretty much what you would expect. Almost 70,000 infections in a country of 9 million people, including Lukashenko himself. As you can probably imagine, in any country, these figures would have an impact on the president's popularity, wouldn't they? Well, yes, but also no. Sociological studies in Belarus are virtually prohibited. In fact, organizations that want to conduct political surveys have to be approved by the government, and often they don't publish the results. This year, several media outlets tried to do an online political survey, and guess what happened? Two things. First, the survey found that Lushenko received 3% in intended votes, and then the government banned election polls. 
Of course, those polls weren't reliable either. It's hard to believe Lukashenko has only 3% support. He still has a lot of support in rural areas. But then again, it defies credibility that, in the midst of a COVID-19 crisis, Lukashenko has received 80% of the vote. Although the regime wants to show it this way, Lukashenko is not the only option. In the 2020 elections, he competed for the presidency alongside four other candidates. Of those four candidates, only one managed to reach the polls. We're talking about Sviatlana Tishkanovskaya. <laughs> This brave woman with an unpronounceable name showed up in her husband's place because he was put in jail in May of this year. And what was his crime? Being a government critical YouTuber. So I guess goodbye to any holidays in Belarus that I might have been wanting in the future. The other candidates were also unable to stand for elections and that's why the entire Belarusian opposition has closed ranks around Mrs. Teskanuskaya. Her election proposal is very clear. A transition to democracy. Basically, she wants to rule nine months until new elections are called. During those nine months, she has promised that she will release all political prisoners and call for clean and transparent elections. Now, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that this proposal has not made Lukashenko very happy. What you probably couldn't have guessed are the arguments that he's made to attack his opponent. Take a look at this. Our constitution is not for a woman, and our society is not mature enough to vote for a woman, because in our constitution, the president has strong power. Yikes. But as you can see, elections in Belarus are nothing like those in other democratic countries. And the same goes for the count. Lukashenko won 80% of the vote against 10% for the opposition. As you might be able to piece together by now, in this election we have seen a complete catalogue of electoral fraud. International observers were banned. On the election day itself, the internet was shut down throughout the country and several journalists critical of Lukashenko's regime were expelled from the country during the campaign. In the day after the election, Lukashenko's opponents, which are clearly more than 10% of voters, took to the streets to protest. So far, this is nothing too surprising. What makes this case so special are the numbers. More than 200,000 people have taken to the streets in Minsk. That's one in 10 inhabitants. Remember, we're talking about a dictatorship where the death penalty still exists. In fact, more than 6,700 protesters are already in jail. Three of them have died at the hands of police. In other words, going out and protesting in Belarus is a very risky venture. The fact that more than 200,000 people dare to demonstrate indicates that there are many more who feel the same way but have stayed at home. At this point, you're probably wondering what happened to Lukashenko's opponent? What happened to that nice lady with the unpronounceable name? Well, this. In this video, you can see how the leader of the opposition, Svetlana Tiskanuskaya, is sitting in an office of the Central Electoral Commission. She's reading from a piece of paper on which it said that the protests should stop and that the demonstrators have to accept Lukashenko's victory. And yes, it is exactly what it seems. The taking of a hostage. Remember that Tiskanuskaya's husband is still in a Belarusian prison. His children have received death threats and, in addition to all of that, several members of her team were also detained at the time that this video was recorded. The same day the video was posted, this announcement came. Svetlana Tikhanovskaya is safe. She is in Lithuania. Since then, Tiskanuskaya has stayed in Lithuania, but she has not abandoned her political aspirations. On the contrary, she has announced that she is prepared to lead a government in exile. Moreover, she has established a coordination council for the democratic transition. Unsurprisingly, Lukashenko is not happy about this at all. So both Tiskanuskaya and her team could be tried for attacking Belarus's national security. All of this explains why both the European Union, like Canada and the United Kingdom do not recognize the results. The elections of the 9th of August 2020 are considered a fraud by almost every country in the world. And which countries do accept the results? Well, in this list we have countries like China, Tajikistan and, of course, Russia. So by this point, I know what you're thinking. We haven't mentioned Putin for a couple of minutes. Think about it. Russia and Belarus are sister countries. In the 1990s, they considered joining officially as one country. Some of the gas and oil that arrives from Russia to Europe passes through the Belarusian pipelines. And Putin and Lukashenko have been great friends for decades. Soviet 
So the real question is, what is Putin going to do in this case? Will he defend Lukashenko? Will he send the Russian army to Minsk to stop the protests? The answer to this question is also the answer to an even more important question. Can Belarus really become a democracy? Let's take a look at that right now. The lesser of two evils. We told you a few weeks ago here on this channel that since early 2020, relations between Putin and Lukashenko have gone from blood brothers to it's complicated. Russia's great aspiration since the 1990s is to annex Belarus. But remember that Lukashenko is a megalomaniac. He's not the classic dictator who agrees to be a puppet of anyone else, much less be a dictator of a country that ceases to exist. So. What has Putin done about it? Well, Putin has been pressuring Lukashenko in the way that he knows best. Threatening to cut off the country's oil and gas supply. These moves could have worked with a rational leader. But we are talking about Lukashenko here. And that's when, in 2020, Lukashenko broke ranks and threatened to steal Russian oil passing through Belarusian pipelines. In other words, interrupt Russia's sale of oil to Europe that goes through pipelines passing through Belarusian territory. So at any time, Belarus could divert those pipes and keep all that dinosaur sword juice. But that is not all. Lukashenko has also been meeting with the White House. Again, we explain this in more detail in a video that I'll leave a link to in the description. But keep this in mind, the European Union has eased many of the sanctions on Belarus since 2016. For the Kremlin, all this means one thing. Lukashenko is making a deal with the enemy and is untrustworthy. And this is the first big difference between Belarus and Ukraine. In 2014, Ukraine was ruled by Viktor Yanukovych, a man loyal to the Kremlin. He may have been corrupt, but he was a rational man. We cannot say the same, however, about Lukashenko. And for this reason, many political analysts set out this scenario. Opinion. Putin wants Belarus in Moscow's orbit, with or without Lukashenko. As we mentioned before, Russia has recognised the totally legitimate election result. In fact, Putin called Lukashenko on the election night to congratulate him. But the declarations end here. At the time of making this video, the Kremlin has not said a word about sending its army to help suppress the protests. And believe me, right now, Lukashenko needs help. And despite all his talk, he doesn't have it. Lukashenko says Putin has promised security assistance for Belarus. And the uncomfortable truth is that Lukashenko needs that support more than ever. To give you an idea, in 2020, both the Belarusian army and police are still using weapons from the Soviet Union. For years, this country has talked about overhauling their army, but they felt too comfortable having Russia's help. However, at this point, Putin's unconditional support is no longer guaranteed. And I know what a lot of you are going to be thinking. Is Russia going to allow Belarus to have an anti-Russian government? Of course not! But here comes my question. Who said that the opposition to Lukashenko has something against Moscow? Has your head exploded yet? Well, if not, watch this. Belarusian opposition says it advocates friendly relations with Russia, other countries. So, to give you an idea, one of these four opposition candidates was Mr. Viktor Babakaira, a manager of Gazprom in Belarus. More specifically, this man was the director of Gazprom's bank in Belarus. And, in case you don't know, Gazprom is the Russian gas industry fully connected to Putin. In other words, Putin has two alternatives. One is to send his army to defend a dictator who has betrayed his trust, and the other is to sit and wait. If Lukashenko wins, the situation goes on as it is. If the democratic opposition wins, everything points to more favourable relations with Russia. And at this point, some of you will be saying, all right, Grant, that is impossible. Putin will not allow an allied country to become a democracy. And the truth is, you're actually wrong. You may be surprised, but this is not the first time a democratic leader has supported Putin. We've seen it before in Armenia. The 2018 revolution brought a democratic transition in that country. Both the current president and the current Armenian prime minister have changed the regime from top to bottom. What's more, they are even proposing to change the country's constitution. In this case, Putin avoided intervening. He could have sent the army to maintain the Armenian regime. But 
he decided to stand by. Today, Armenia is going through a democratic transition, but it remains an ally of Russia, and relations with Putin are as good as they were before the revolution. Something similar could happen in a hypothetical Belarusian transition. Moreover, there's the idea that Russia could have more influence in a free election than in a dictatorship. Think about it. In a country like Belarus, the means of communication are very limited. After all, we're talking about a country with less than 10 million inhabitants that has been mired in dictatorship without freedom of expression for 24 years. The Kremlin has had an immense propaganda machine, from Russia Today to internet bots. Well used, that machinery could serve to propel a pro-Russian candidate straight into the driving seat. In other words, Putin might be interested in getting Lukashenko out of the way. And all of this explains why, unlike what happened in Ukraine in 2014, Putin is currently saying these things about Belarus. Putin tells Merkel foreign interference in Belarus's affairs is unacceptable. And the irony of that statement coming from no less than Vladimir Putin should not be lost on anyone. However, days after the conversation with Merkel on the 27th of August, Putin announced on Russian television that he had special forces command ready to act if the situation gets out of control. We still do not know if he's just saying this or if Russia really will be willing to take action. What we can say is that Lukashenko has already proven himself the loser in the show of defiance against Putin. But now we leave the question over to you. Do you think that the Belarusian opposition will succeed in overthrowing Lukashenko? Could this be the beginning of democracy in Belarus? Will I ever be able to go there on holiday? You can leave me your answers in the comments. We really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit like and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos. You can also click the little alarm button down there and you'll get an update whenever we release new content. Also, this channel is possible because of Patreon and our patrons on that platform. Please consider joining them and supporting our mission of providing independent political coverage. And, as always, I'll see you next time.